Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, apparently, millions of people lived uh, basically millions of li lifetimes all on the streets of Amsterdam. And every day, a lot of us pass these streets, walk through these streets, and actually walk through the same streets that all these people lived and see the remnants of these streets, but we never ever see any remnants of the people, only the streets. Um, if you, uh, yeah, right. If you ignore the swarms of tourists and all the bikes, um, you would still see the historical uh, streetscape and only a sort of ghost town would remain. And that ghost town brings us back to Amsterdam in the 18th century, in the 16th century, or even the 15th or 14th century. But again, it's, it's a ghost town. Uh, and I've pictured here the, the, the worst of the ghost town where there was actually all sand everywhere and uh, gusts of wind would, uh, would actually draw sand through the whole place. And does anyone know where it is? No, no, it's actually where we are right now. So this is... Rutters Island, the uh, original island. There was only a sort of tiny, tiny island there in, inhabited with just gusts of sand of, of a city completely unleft. But even in the very uh, busy district of the city, if we look at the maps, we only see a sort of ghost town and we get no sense of the people living in there. So, you know, what would we, what would we, would we get if we would try to put the people in these streets and get a sense of the people that would be walking through the streets. And if you ask the current literature that's written on the topic, you will get this very stupid answer, I think. Um, so we would now say that on average, men dominate historical writing exactly because they control public space and because our sources are mostly of the public kind. We may rightly regret this, but only a resolutely different approach of the history of Amsterdam from a pervasive gender perspective can change this image. Um, but if you think about the statement for a little bit, it becomes a bit of a paradox. Uh, because it seems impossible, impossible to me to conclude that men control public space if you don't have a gender perspective. Um, so it's presented as a premise, but actually it's a conclusion of a research not yet carried out. But maybe someone can carry out this research, and of course that's what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm doing, uh, trying to answer the question, did man really control public space, or maybe better, who controls public space anyway? And how do they do it? And can we even get a sense of what the historical people did and how they uh, claimed their streets and how they took ownership of the streets? Um, so I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam. I'm doing this as part of a team of people that are also doing this for Tokyo and Berlin. Uh, and I got the honor to do the Amsterdam part of it, which is what I will tell you about today. Um, Okay, some researchers have it easier because they study people that aren't dead for 200 or 300 years, and they can step out in the street and uh, find out how streets work, what people do, and how they claim their own neighborhood as their own, uh, and I can't. And my life would be much easier if in the 18th century we had some system of surveillance like they have in China right now, where you can just sit back behind a computer and see what different people are doing, what the categories of people are, uh, where they're going and get all this neat little data out of a surveillance system. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, there wasn't a system like that in the 18th century, uh, so we have to find something else. Um, luckily, historians are a stubborn bunch and we don't easily give up, so we found the second best thing, which is this. Uh, sources on surveillance in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, it might look a bit threatening, but if you stare at it long enough, you can also read it. Um, also, if you go 100 years further, you can actually read it because it's just easier to read. And this one is from 1750. Um, and I'll can just show you that it has all these sort of, sort of categories and information of stuff happening in the city, on the streets, um, where it's specified who's doing what, where they live, where they're coming from, and what time e it even is, and what the actions of these people are. And it starts to look a bit more like these Chinese surveillance systems already. Um, all right, so what are they? They're witness statements drawn up by a notary. They're drawn up by the notary because something happened, because the sheriff or the chief officer wanted to know what happened and why it happened, and people would go to, to these notary and all together would patch, it, uh, would patch some kind of narrative into what we end up with now. Um, yeah. Luckily, if you feed the computer enough of these, you can 
get the computer to read it, which is very, very useful and speeds up my research uh, a lot. Uh, this is software called Transcribus, made by a group of scholars uh, from the University of Innsb uh, Innsbruck in Austria. Uh, and we can process these texts now much faster than we uh, ever could. We can now also search through them and find specific terms, but also uh, just go through a lot of them systematically in a, at speeds that were just uh, not possible before. Um, yeah, and it's very important that we can do this because um, now I have more time to actually go through it. And I do this through the following basic sort of structure of, uh, let's, let's call it data structuring, of just finding a lot of individuals, events, and locations in this type of material. Um, and then I uh, can add all types of subcategories to it. Uh, it becomes a bit more complicated, but not entirely too complicated, because some of the uh, things that you see, maybe you can point, yeah. So, for, of course, a residence is a location, so the residence could also have all this type of information, a person, uh, is also an individual, so a person showing up in an event can also have a residence, which then becomes a location, while the event also has a location, so it, it becomes a lot of fun at some point, when you have a lot of these stacking together and a lot of information that we never really were able to so systematically look at, because it was all sort of buried down in these, these texts that we had. All right. Um, so while this is all great and it's actually cool that historians are moving towards digitization and are more embracing new digital methods, um, it's also great that we have our very old uh, uh, sort of historical methods and that there are also a lot of historians that are a bit old-fashioned and don't like computers at all and they say, well, actually, we have this thing called uh, in history called source critique. And we critique our sources, and it's the backbone of historical scholarship because we're just looking for problems in our own source material and saying, well, can we actually conclude these things? Uh, because, of course, if I would put all these witness statements of conflicts happening throughout the city in a database and uh, just look at it, what I would create is a city of men. A uh, city of men dominating st the streets. They're violent men, they're drunk men, they have knives, they're calling each other thief and whore, and they're stabbing everyone. Throwing rocks through windows, and it's not a nice database. Um, so the streets streetscape filled with perpetrators of these sources would show Amsterdam in violent chaos, uh, as if everyday life was in continuous disruption as a Pirates of the Caribbean movie, basically. And uh, what I do to counter this is, of course, what I call bystander history. While the perpetrators are very interesting for criminal history, which is a completely different subdiscipline, which is also very, very interesting, that's not what I'm doing. I'm looking at what witnesses and bystanders are doing. So I'm also very much trying to mark out who are the perpetrators and who aren't, and get a sense of what bystanders are doing, why they are at a certain place, and sort of get the, well, they're not often innocent, but get more of the innocent background of the scene, and get all these sort of interesting scenes happening, um, in this database to you know, basically prevent that I have these violent street streetscapes full of culprits. Um, right, and those stories of ordinary people that are just bystanders are the most difficult to access because history, and especially in the public imagination, is filled with princes, war heroes, and remarkable plots. There's, so there's a certain tension that many of the histories that we tell are histories of exception. Uh, out of these random and not so random bystanders, we often have only one or a few mentions in the sources at all. So these are not the well-recorded elites, but they are people that have escaped their attention for ages and are in a way sort of resurrected back in this database. Um, well, some of these documents give us much more than the names of people and are also very interesting in themselves. Uh, and some of the stories are just brilliant, so I also wanted to share them with you. Um, and I have the cases to sort of read them because I really want to be as specific as I can be uh, because there is some detail in it that's just very brilliant. So in March 1710, uh, ordinary life at the Amsterdam Botermarkt, current day Rembrandtplein, was disrupted when Grietje Veenendaal, who had a market stand with stockings, was attacked by another market woman. The two women had a dispute over the location of their market stand, after which Lena pulled Grietje backwards and threw her, threw her on the ground. Lena's two daughters and the husband of one of them joined the fight and kicked Grietje brutally. After the violence, when Grietje had fled to the chief officer to make a statement, people gossiped in the market that a man had attacked Grietje. 
Perhaps this happened, happened because of the presence of the son-in-law. Nevertheless, one of Lena's daughters then returned to the scene to dispel those rumors. She told bystanders while beating her chest that it was no man who did that, but me and my mother. So this case shows this textile market as an urban space dominated by women. Uh, gives us a sense of these rumors spreading through, uh, through a market and the presumed gender of the attacker. There's even a theatrical claiming of violence by a woman as a woman. Um, uh, and she's sort of claiming the violence proudly as her own, as a part of a conflict over ownership of not just the street, of the market, of, of, of her entrepreneurship, basically. Right, then secondly, there's this case from the Jordaan, so we are turning to the Jordaan, um, from 1742, where Maria Houtrops and Wessel Barker were at the home of Hadrianus Riel in the Tuinstraat. This is not the Tuinstraat, but it looks a bit like it. Uh, when the owner of the house that... Uh, Hadrianus Riel was living in appeared. So these two witnesses testified for the notary of the chief officer that the landlord had come in and had demanded a month worth of rent, even though the regular payday would be at the end of the month, which wasn't for weeks. Uh, so uh, y uh, obviously Hadrianus refused to pay, then offered to have the money ready within three days. But these conflicts that the chief officer investigated had a certain severity. In the rest of October, the chief officer's notary had handled the cases of a man who had driven his coach into a crowd, tax evasion, smuggling, and several assaults that left victims bleeding. Yet, the case that he handled today with the landlord involved an act that left nobody bleeding, although some form of gaping wound was created. When he did not receive the money, the landlord took off with the front door of the house. So, as the landlord took off with the front door of the house and the witnesses went to the chief officer to, to tell him about this uh, actually very severe act, we have to realize that something as a door is something completely different in early modern Amsterdam. You have this theory of the open house, that houses in early modern times uh, were much more mixed and much more part of the street than we see them now. So the, taking the door out is also sort of taking out the threshold that separates the house from the street. Um, because it's sort of the only thing that's le uh, leaving the house from the street, but it's a very important place where people are, are interacting, where people are communicating with each other, and basically where people live out their lives. Um, yeah, so the door, the window, and often a two-part door that people could rest their upper body on was vital for neighborhood communication. So this guy is a great example of the door as communication. Who, may maybe someone knows who he is, or what kind of person he is. The guy in black. Huh? A tax, a tax collector. No. No. Um, he is in uh, something called an aanspreker, which you would uh, translate as appealer. So, but he's not really appealing when he comes to your house because what he does is he tells you someone died. And when he comes to your house and he tells you someone died, it's a very sad ritual moment, but he also requests you to close your house, and that means close it off. So you close your windows, you put down your curtains, you close your door, and anybody walking through the street seeing a closed house would say, think, hey, someone is dead, who, who died? So, and even up until late 19th century, people throughout Amsterdam, when they saw a house closed, they wouldn't think, ah, oh, that's someone that needs privacy, but they would think, oh, someone died. So having your house closed was also something very suspect. Having privacy really wasn't very obvious, but it was also something that you wouldn't do with your neighbors because it wasn't the, uh, a social situation that people wanted. So as life happened in open doors uh, where people mixed and uh, the distinction between being outside and inside was, was very much more blurred than it is to us now, um, there are some exceptions. Because, yeah, I found this one case in 1715 of a very rich elite man living on the canal belt, so the Grachtengordel, uh, uh, who specifically said that he requested uh, someone to come into my house because I do not speak people on the doorstep or in the door. So this sense of privacy that we, that we might have now or feeling comfortable talking about specific uh, things in specific public spaces was very much something that certain elite groups could still actually achieve and they actually built their houses in such ways that they could achieve it. Um, and if we do a little first spatial analysis of the data that I have, uh, we can get a map of the surveillance of the city through eyes of witnesses. So here we see a heat map of all the witnesses in 1750, or no, actually the first 445, but 
um, and the places where they were witnessing. And what we see is actually that this exact canal belt, um, right now, but also then uh, a symbol for rich elite Amsterdam, basically, um, was able to get out and stay out of these, 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 these witness eyes. That meant, of course, partly that there was a form of class justice. They also were able not to be prosecuted by the chief officer. Um, but my theory is that um, it also represents a type of privacy and retreat from public space into the private space that was a privilege for the elite. Now, the next step is, of course, much more systematic insight into these patterns and to break down how and where people of different social status and gender worked, lived, and went about in daily life. Um, and I can give you a small preview of my uh, of, of my next step, made just this morning, so not really analyzed yet, don't ask me too much questions about it, uh, or do, but we'll, we'll, we'll get out of it together. Uh, and these are the shortest distances between places where people are found all throughout the city and where they leave, where, where they live. So you see these paths of people going through the city and we can measure the distance of where they are, and right now it's just this sort of, sort of uh, uh, let's say, tie that I still have to unknot, quite literally. Um, uh, full of information of different people of different occupations, of different genders, of different ages that we can uh, analyze to find something about the daily mobility of people, where they went, why they went to certain places, and then in the end get closer to the question, who owns public space? Uh, so for now I have to complete the database and run the analysis, so um, if we want to get the answer to who owns public, play, uh, public space, please ask me again in uh, two years or so. Thank you.